Hello, everyone, and welcome to the latest episode of Vox Vomitus. I am your host, Jennifer Ann Gordon, the author of the Kindle Award-winning novel, Beautiful, Frightening, and Silent, as well as Pretty Ugly and the Hotel series. Joining me, as always, is my Vox Vomitus vixen, Alison Martine, author of The Bourbon Books, which include the award-winning novel Dibs since September, Move on Melinda, and most recently, Climb the Salmon Ladder. With us today is author extraordinaire, publicist extraordinaire, Caitlin hamilton Summy. We are here to talk to her about all things book, all things Caitlin, all <laughs> things uh, about, you know, you have your fingers in a lot of different places in this industry. So we are excited. I wanted to say pies. Are there pies? Pies? I would love it if there were pies. That's I the phrase. That. Fingers yeah. and pies, right? Is that the phrase? Yeah. Fingers of dozens of different pies. Sorry. Maybe that's just uh, salt. Mm -hmm. That's a line from Evita. Oh, I'm already yes, quoting musicals. Right. I'm sorry. With fingers right. and dozens of different Is that a that's... line from Evita? Really? I know most of most musicals are up here. Not helpful in any way. Yeah. Shape. No, that's weird. I, didn't that I, didn't... I mean, I've seen it. I didn't know. Yeah, yeah, I'm like, I, it's weird that I didn't pick that up because Evita used to be one of my major shower shows that I would sing the whole thing. In the oh, show. I like the shower, like for a baby shower. You mean actually yeah. in the shower singing like, the whole yeah, thing? Yeah, yeah, like off key. It's from Good Night and Thank You. Yes. No, so, anyways, Caitlin. <laughs> I was going to say, I've, I don't really know many people who have seen Evita. Oh, I've you seen know, it twice on the stage and then obsessively watched the movie many times. I think it's such an interesting show and it's yeah. not the one you hear about most often. At least I don't. So that's very interesting. Okay. But I'm sorry. My mom had the, the Patty Lupone and uh, Mandy Patinkin, the, the actual LP. So that's what I grew yes. up listening to. And then I saw a really, they tried hard dinner production. I will not say more. <laughs> they tried really big. Okay. So, Caitlin, welcome to our show. Thank Tell you. our audience a little bit about yourself and a little bit about your book, Geographies of the Heart. Well, first of all, thanks for having me. I've been really excited and I feel really honored to be here. Um, I am a mom. I am um, a, you know, a sister. Um, I take care of some parents sometimes, so I'm a daughter. Um, and in between all that, I'm a wife too. Um, in between all that, I am a book publicist by day. I run a book publicity firm with my husband, Rick. And Rick serves as my publicist for my books when I when I send them out into the world. I was um, going to ask. I was just like, it must be difficult being a publicist and trying to publicize your own books. Nobody wants to wear that hat. No, I liken it a lot to what I think a doctor must feel like being a patient. Because Ooh, yeah. I've heard that that for doctors, sometimes it's really hard to be a patient. And I feel a little bit sorry for Rick sometimes that he has to live with me and be my publicist. Because I'll <laughs> sort of look over the edge. I'll be like, any news? Any news? Okay. Yeah. Well, it's Did what you like. So in a former life, I was an attorney. And what is the, the joke? It's like only a fool has himself as their own attorney or as their own counsel. So I'm sure it's the same thing that there are things that you should not do for yourself. Don't right. cut your own hair. You know, no, you I, I've done hair. that though. I, <laughs> Maybe not I, during COVID, but that doesn't count. I'm like, I've been cutting my own hair for 20 years. Okay, you do <laughs> a great <laughs> job. I wasn't so great, but I mean, but yeah, no, mine's think, not great. I mean, like one of my dearest, she is, she is my hairstylist and she likes to go to a different salon to get her hair done. She doesn't do it herself. She leaves someone else to do it. So it's not that you don't have the skills, but you don't want to apply it to your own self. You're li physically, she's too close to it. You know? I get that it's because I'm like, my day job is I'm a ballroom dance instructor and I'm a mm -hmm. choreographer. But when I used to have a burlesque troupe, I hated choreographing for myself. Oh, yeah. So like when it was time for me to do a solo, I was like, oh my God, I have no ideas at all. See, this is where I'm inserting the <laughs> dancing with myself. Come like that, that comment's unnecessary. I just want to say, <laughs> too late. <laughs> I think though, I do. One of the things I think as a publicist and a writer though, is we all do have some wisdom about our own books. So <laughs> we hey, all Kelly. Wave. Hi, Kelly. Hi, Kelly. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I don't want to do my own publicity, but I do have, nobody knows the book better than I do. That's true. And so yeah. I can weigh in and on occasion I'll reach out and, and my perspective matters. And I feel that that is true for my authors, that it mm. really needs to be 
to go with Vox Vomitus here, kind of like a dance, you know, oh, like yes. I have a vision and they have a vision and we have to find a way to put the book out there for its audience in a way that makes sense for them. Um, and the, my perspective is valuable, but so is theirs. Because I'll have authors say to me, you know, I mean, you're the publicist. And I'll say, I know. But you wrote the book. But you wrote the book. <laughs> the book. Yeah, that's the perfect way to say it, Allison. And so, you know, Rick, back to Rick, who is the kindest person alive. He just, he would listen. And then he did what he thought was best, you know. And so we can blame Rick that you haven't been on the show before. <laughs> just throw him right under that bus. Let's, let's not go there. He's such a he's such a good guy. He works so hard, you know. And I feel you know it's it's got to be hard to be your wife's publicist. I mean, we when we bring people into the business because we keep it small by choice. Um, it's a really personal process, and I mean, I just had an author send me like family picture, you know, because you get really close to people yeah. and, and you really care. And it's not just a job and it's not just about the book. It's, you know, you're trying to shepherd a voice. What a privilege, yeah. right? You're trying to shepherd a voice and, and a career. So we get really close to people. And so every yes, we often actually get up and dance um oh. and every no we're kind of hang dog you know so i can't imagine how it feels for him when it's his wife you know so every success I know, that's a lot <laughs> yeah i mean i'm just like because really how do you break it like oh we didn't get that feature he just so, tells me you yeah. didn't get it and i'll say before okay. when i Give first me a hug. when i first started writing um and i didn't have a publicist and i was trying to publicize myself and book myself on shows but it sounds like it's hard to do yeah. and Allison and I have like talked about this. We're like, it's so hard to do it yourself. Um, and then my husband, who's not a publicist and is at all. Um, he isn't, but he's done. He he's, has helped. I know he helped me when I was first starting out. Yeah. So even he, when I didn't technically have anybody in that, it's like, well, Roman's kind of my publicist and my producer. And he's, yeah, everything. yeah. He, he, you know, he, <laughs> he he's that. very sweet. He'd be like, you know, when I first started out, he's just like, do you want me to try to book you on podcasts? And I'm like, Sure. I mean, it was right when COVID started too, and we were both out of work and it was just like, he's like, I've got nothing to do. I'll, <laughs> I'll contact a bunch of, you know, podcasts. And, and it was just, it was so helpful. Mm -hmm. And it's so, it's such an important role um, in the, the author's life. And everybody I know needs a shepherd. everybody needs a shepherd. And I will say we have interviewed a lot of your authors. Yeah, we and, know. and I'm so psyched every time they get selected. I'm like, <laughs> and I will. And I, you know, we read all their books and you are thanked profusely in all of their <laughs> acknowledgments. So I, that's just, it's such a nice sign. Like you're doing you're doing a great job because you know, your authors are just like, and Caitlin, I like, I love her. <laughs> well, we, I mean, we really care about our people. And I, you know, I think that um, whether or not there's an acknowledgement, I hope that that care always shows whether or not we achieve everything that we want for an author. I hope that they know we left it all on the field. We did everything we could. We threw every touchdown pass we could. We threw, you know, um, I hope you guys like football because we're a big football and baseball house. Um, like but no, no, I'm, a, I'm an indoor girl. Sports. Yeah, we're not we sports really, girl in our face. And, and our family, we're like, we played the sport. I'm like, which one? I don't know. Shooty hoops. <laughs> shooty hoops. It's always shooty, shooty hoops. hoops. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I, got, I had a baseball phase for a while. because Love I was baseball. like, That's my favorite. I was like, I, I want to say dating a guy who was into baseball, but dating is probably overstating <laughs> whatever we were. Um, and he was really into baseball. So on, And then I started watching the Red Sox because he was always watching the Red Sox. And... I got kind of really into it. I love baseball. I mean, what I'm really into um, is college baseball. And for those of you who are interested in baseball, you might know that the Tennessee Vols were the number one team this year and were projected to take it all <laughs> and didn't. I'm we like didn't. an indoor cat. I don't know yeah. any of this. No, it's just, like, mm. just a day of heartbreak down oh. in Knoxville, Tennessee. So... 
That's why I'm not using any baseball metaphors. But yeah, it's, for it's our a, authors, we do have right now. Thing. We don't go there. <laughs> yeah. We don't yeah. go there. No, and I understand most football metaphors because I was in the marching band, so I went to all the football games, and I knew whether or not we were doing well depending on what song I was being told to play. So I'm like, oh, <laughs> oh, I love oh, that. Oh, my God. oh wait, we're doing this. All right, I should probably stop eating and pick up my clarinet. All right, this is good. Allison, you need to use that in the book. That's <laughs> hilarious. I that knew what so was going cute. on because I knew what. So Nobody wants of... to hear about more band geeks. Allison Hannigan ruined it for all of us. Thank you. No, you. no, no. I would. Camp? <laughs> I would read a book about band geeks. <laughs> I or even just a scene in a book. I mean, yeah. that's just hilarious. <laughs> I think it's. I think it's funny. So, so Caitlin, tell us a little bit about your book, Geographies of the Heart. I'm like, you, 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 this is why you're an amazing publicist. You just spent, you know, the first few minutes of the show, <laughs> instead of talking about yourself, talking, talking about, about your clients, talking about your clients. Well, it was heartfelt. It was heartfelt. But <laughs> Geographies of the Heart um, took me about 27 years. And it's because oh. I know, right? No, I get it. Fiction's written in real time. Sometimes you're like, yeah. this one was written then. This one was written in eight, 1984. <laughs> right? the book, it's written in these different sections and there's a year there, which helps me orient it. I didn't think it was written over that time, but that explains stuff now. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, because I work, because I'm a mom, I call those Always, I call them my happy interruptions. But this is a novel about a young woman named Sarah McMillan, and it begins when she graduates from college. And she has always been very dedicated to her family, which is multi-generational, growing up in one house. And it's about her sister, Glynnie, her younger sister, who's really dedicated always to her career. She's had a vision ever since she was little that she wanted to be a doctor. And so as the girls age, and as they face the challenges that life inevitably brings, they are forced to confront very differing priorities. And those play out in the family sphere as people age, as people get ill. And as an intermediary, sometimes Sarah's husband, Al, tries to come in um, and, and unruffle the, the feathers. <laughs> um, it's very much a novel, I think, of about sisters, about forgiveness, about identity. Um, and about the power of family history. But when I when I talk about the book, I say ultimately the way I see it is that it's a story about that really fertile, rich, terribly fragile ground that's family, which is the first terrain, the first landscape. It's, it is the first geography to shape our hearts. And so that's what Geographies of the Heart is about. One family's geography of hearts. Oh. It's very well said. I know that's so beautiful. Thank you. And your writing is very lush. And I mean, I'm, we're Allison and I are both really big fans of literary style work. Um, I love books that are written in like little vignettes, mm -hmm. little like little just scenes that, you know. The scenes that tell you, that larger story. Yeah. Like, this is a representation of what this relationship is like, but under just this tiny microscope. And you don't have to say all the details because they're in there. They're just part of the fabric of this relationship. And I am a, I am my sister and I love my sister. And see, Jen, I love my sister. We joke this. <laughs> Because I, Jen reminds me a lot of my sister. So if I ever say anything negative about my sister, she's like, but I remind you of your sister. I know. I'm <laughs> like, wait a minute. You so much. <laughs> you just <laughs> said. But you weren't the one who tortured me as a child and said the mummy was going to come get me. And yes, that happened too. Um, but, but the whole idea of like the way the sisters have different ways of communicating and how that creates this kind of unintentional discord. Like the fact that they are, even though they're raised in the same house, but the same parents just their natural inclinations being different creates this rift that kind of grows out of almost nothing, but just gets bigger and bigger. I related to that big time because my sister and I, we are very different. We're very similar in certain ways, but we're very different in other ways. And there've been times when it's like, well, what, what are the issues between you and her? It's like, well, just, we're just different people. And so sometimes there wasn't, it wasn't that there wasn't love there. It wasn't that there was animosity there, but because we weren't communicating on the same wavelength, it comes across that way. So I feel like you really captured that. So Caitlin, Thank tell you. us what your sister did <laughs> as a child. I don't have a sister. <laughs> oh, I don't the whole time. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I don't have a sister. I have an older brother who I think is awesome. 
um, the kind of guy who, when everyone dropped me off at college, my mom was crying, my dad was crying. Aww. They left the room in a hurry, you know. And my Aww. brother, who's, my brother, turned around. He's older, and he was, he was, you know, just tall and blonde, and this Viking guy. And he turned around. So is he Al? He was, no, he's not Al at all. No, but I mean, he was like, um, he was featured once at a business where he worked on the cover for all their promotional material. <laughs> like, he's sort of model. Oh. Like, he's not Al. He was very ideal man. handsome, right? Okay. But he turned around to me when I left college and said, have a kick ass time. You can swear. And, and out fine. the door he went, is it okay to swear? Yes. Oh yeah. Okay. Oh yeah. So um, we, we usually cover that before the show. Like you can oh, yeah, swear, we, it's fine. Drink, yeah. And it's funny that you're even worried about the word ass because so just down the street from my house, they have now started replacing one of the Starbucks with a place called Bad Ass Coffee, right? Oh, okay. And, okay. and I'm, it has a picture of a donkey and, and all my kids are looking like, oh, there's a bad word. I'm like, guys, an ass is a kind of animal. It's an old fashioned word for a donkey. And they're like, but it means butt. I'm like, yes, it does. Like, it it's does mean the butt. Christmas songs. Good Christian men rejoice. Our ox and ass before him bow. But yes, as a child, that was our favorite part to say because we're like, ask. Well, I don't, I didn't want to offend, but that's what he said. Yeah. So I just, my brother was, is hey. wonderful, fun. He's a great the big quote brother. had so to no. be accurate. He didn't yeah. say, yes, the tiny. Ha have a, yeah, have a wonderful say, time. <laughs> have, a, have a wonderful time at your scholarly endeavors, Caitlin. Endeavors. Right. Yeah. No. So enjoy um, your studying. <laughs> I don't know where Glenny came from exactly. <laughs> Uh, you know that relationship but I think it's true it's really interesting you're the only person Allison who said that the tension between them in in a lot of ways comes from nothing yeah and it is this you know this one or two moments where somebody feels there was a slight or that exactly, I mean it yeah. meant a lot to them and they were let down they were really really exactly. Sarah was really yeah. really let down but because you weren't there for me when I thought you should have been there for me Right. And but she and, never said, Oh, I wish you were, you know, like there's just that lack of communication. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that people just happens. That. Yeah. yeah they, it just happens. Do. And I think you know, that's more realistic for me than seeing a lot of a lot of books where you read these over the top domestic situations where someone really is a villain because yeah, there are people out there who were that extreme, but I feel like the tension that's more accurate and believable for me are people who they usually mean well, but there's just something that's discordant that's just yeah. not quite clicking. And then that discord grows. And instead of being able to communicate clearly, those hurts, we like nurse them and feed them and make them bigger and bigger. And the next thing you know, everybody has these giant hurts that just weigh us down. And I love how you explored that because I feel like a lot of times it's like, oh, no, this person was psychotic and secretly drugging her or something. And thank you. Your book did not go there. Yeah. Not yeah. Fun. You know, it was, very, it was very it was very real. Like, you know, I just I don't have a sister. I'm an only child. But to me, it reminded me a lot of like my relationship with my mother. Like we've mm -hmm. always been off. Mm -hmm. We're just, you know, that you have red hair. That is true. I mean, <laughs> genetics from her. From my dad. Well, okay, so she married him. So, so I'm like, he you chose remember, the you hair married hair. a Scottish man. Um, yeah, so, and, and like, you can never, I can never pinpoint, like, where and what exactly is wrong with our relationship, especially when I was a teenager. Going back to what we were talking about before the show, and I said, I was a terrible teenager. But how old was you um, were a teenager? I was a teenager. I think all teenagers... Potentially all teenagers are, are difficult, or at least difficult at times, you know? It's the, I don't you know, know it's many the of hormones. us who sail through. Oh my gosh. Yeah, it's I like... don't think anyone just sails through. But maybe I'm wrong. That's just my opinion, you know, but... I know. I, mean, I always, I try to like remember high school and I'm just like, was there anybody there that was like having a great time? Like, ha like... I don't know. And were they really? Because... <laughs> Now and that I we're on the other mine. side of it. No, and I think everybody has a different one. And I was going to say for me and my, and my mom, and my mom passed away, but I feel like she and I were enough alike that she, even if I didn't want to tell her stuff, she figured it out because we were on those same wavelengths. Whereas my sister was the one who would go and hide in her room. And I don't want to get political here, but she recently posted something saying, you know, for, for 4th of July, we shouldn't be wearing red, white, and blue. We should be wearing black. And I almost put down, you always wear black, but I didn't want to, I didn't want to like take away her post because it was heartfelt, but I'm just like, you've been wearing black since 1987. So don't give me this, like, this is new. That's, that's always <laughs> like, like getting her to wear a color because that was just who she was. And we're just always different people that way. So I feel like Jen, with you and your mom were different. There's, there's the rub that 
oh, yeah. we aren't wired exactly the same. And we don't, we don't respond to things exactly the same. Exactly. My mom and I were on enough of the same wavelength that if anything, we drove each other bonkers because I'm like, how did you know I liked this boy? I could tell. I haven't ever said his name. Like, are you also a mind reader? I think she was. See, my mom is actually right. psychic. So, oh, even worse. So no it was. She too. knew what you were thinking. No She always knew what I was thinking. Um, well, that's and, uncomfortable. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's yeah. that's uncomfortable. <laughs> it's, it's uncomfortable. It's it's a it's a really bad scene, <laughs> especially in high school, <laughs> and and my twenties, and and my thirties. It's like I know. <laughs> last summer. I know. What just, you're in general, just in just general. Just in general. Just in general. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think that's how people are, and I think that, you know, I don't know if you've bumped into this, but sometimes in in my life, I've I've bumped into a couple people who have sort of a vision of the way the family should be or a family should be. And yes. um, and I think Sarah is kind of like that. The family is supposed to be a certain, this is the way we are supposed to behave. You should have been there for this, you know? And I think not everybody has the same vision of what a family is. It's not just, you know, that, that Glenny had different priorities. She just yeah. loved differently, you know? That's yes. exactly it. And, yeah, it, and it's I, one of those things where you never outright said these are are the different characters' love languages, but mm -hmm. that was hugely on display there. How different people did things. And, I mean, I loved I loved the relationship between Al and then his his like grandfather in law because it wasn't even his yes. grandfather. And oh I've never gosh. seen that in real life where someone like latches onto someone of a different generation who they're not even related to in such a caring and loving way. And it was really beautiful to see, especially male love. So I'm going to get all touchy feeling here, but you know, a lot of men don't necessarily have that in their own families and to then yeah. see it going, Oh, Hey, I can feel part of this family and I can get that multi-generational love from, from man to man mm -hmm. in a way that's actually I will support it was their relationship and that little chunk of the book that i think i messaged you caitlin and i said you're i'm crying and it yeah, was that and then section got, and I it was, was like, that oh. section. yeah because i was well, just I'll, like oh you know like al yeah I, I loved that i loved the scene i loved the grandpa i loved the, <laughs> you know the donut shop i know i also now just want donuts yes sorry i should have i should have yeah. oh. we should have had donuts we, we should have had, had donuts, donuts. You know oh. what? My kids left a half-eaten donut around here, so I'm not seeing it. I guess a different kid came by and <laughs> ate the rest. Of it. I it's wish fine. I, had donut. I think oh, it's hard with donuts. um with multi generational stories, though sometimes too, because I think, you know, there are people who don't have grandmas and grandpas, and I was really lucky to have my grandma and grandpa very much a part of my life. I mean, this is not my grandma and my grandpa. My grandma was just so sweet. You know, she was the kind of woman you'd be having dinner and we'd all be talking. She'd just be eating, doing her thing. And there'd be a lull in the conversation and she'd come up with the wisecrack or the or the better joke, you know, this quiet little lady. And we just all bust out laughing, you know, she'd that. call her moments and so she's not the the sharp character that that Catherine portrays, but I think, you know, I guess it was just neat to be able to portray a family like that, where the grand grandparents were were integral, where the relationships mattered, where, um, you know, even Al who didn't have that, he he had honorary grandparents in the end, you know. Yeah. It's just well, and you tackled some of those issues that are really hard for those sandwich generations. And when you've got, you know, your own young kids and then elderly parents or grandparents or great grandparents. And I, I know one of the things my sister and I, we moved from Pennsylvania to California when we were little. So we had grandparents, but we never really knew them because we'd see them once every other year for like a week. And they were, they were basically strangers. They were lovely strangers, but I, I have some memories of them, but it's not the same as people I know who grew up knowing their grandparents and their grandparents being at every holiday and birthday and just other occasions. And that's something I, I really deliberately want for my kids mm -hmm. to, to do that. And then my mom passed away. So they don't really have the grandmother on that side from my mom, but my dad remarried. So they've got, they've got a May May on that side. And then my <laughs> husband's parents. And it's just such a different thing to see my kids like, wow, they actually know these grandparents yeah. and okay, we don't live in the same house. That would be, that would be too much. <laughs> but just to have that and seeing how then as an adult, when those parents and then those grandparents are now 
ending at like at the end of their lifespan and how that impacts it's it's a huge thing because people do die it wasn't like anybody was dying prematurely in these things but yeah. just how that impacts you when these people have been so integral to your life yeah i mean i i don't have a sister but i did grow up in a multi-generational house we did all live together and so oh. even though these aren't my grandparents that is an experience that i understand you yeah. know i remember um my grandmother pulling out the newspapers she saved from D-Day. Oh, wow. And we're like, whoa. And that is so cool. Like, we, it, it's amazing. Yeah, we have, um, that is one thread that's true, where I talk about the grandpa having lied about his age, and racing down yeah, to the list. Yeah, my grandfather lied about his age to serve in World War One. And he lied, and, and then when World War II came around, they told him he was too old, and he said he was going anyway. So they better find him a place. Oh, I love God. that. Put me uh, somewhere. So I'm sorry, my, that just, just put me somewhere. Yeah, yeah that's somewhere. what he said, you know, and they know. did. <laughs> you know, they my, said my father was um, a lot older than my mother, so he in World War II he was only twelve, um, but everybody in his little town in New Hampshire, like every man was gone. Yes. And my father was the oldest of 10 kids and he drove the school bus because was there was 12? no, when he was 12, there was nobody left it. in this I little farm it. town in New Hampshire. So he drove the school bus and like would park it at school. And he was allowed to get out a little early because he, had, and he That's was incredible. like, I liked it because I got to show up a little late to school <laughs> and leave a little early. But yeah, he, he drove the school bus and I always like, I think of that and I'm like, yeah. that is just so incredible. And yeah. his mother stayed at our house every single weekend growing up for years and years and years. So she was very much a part of my childhood. Whereas my mother's mother, I met one time. That's it. Yeah. That's okay. Yeah. 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 She, cause she lived far away mm -hmm. and you know, mothers and daughters sometimes have strained relationships. My mother and her mother had a strained relationship. So yeah, met her once, it was a complete stranger. I'm just like, oh, hello. We are Your grandma. Really genetically. <laughs> yes. Nice it's to meet you. I was eight. Far away. <laughs> yeah, it's hard when people are far away. And I think, I mean, I guess it's it, there are lots of ways to be far away. You know, what, yeah, I know. think that's what we were talking about before. That I love that word discordant because you can be far away even if you're in the same house, you know? Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah. Families, yeah. families can be tough. Family can. Be well, that's tough. why you know um, it's always so. It's like a breath of fresh air to like read a literary novel that is just about life, and you know, not necessarily like I write horror, and but more like literary horror. Allison mm -hmm. writes romance, but she also writes literary sci-fi and fantasy, mm -hmm. and we read a ton of books for this show, and we you know after a while we're like there was a kick where every book we read was domestic suspense i don't know how that happened but everybody was dying i, I know i was just like oh no <laughs> and i love and i and people love dying domestic and there was suspense. corpses everywhere but it was like two months straight of yeah. of I, like I think, oh I god think we need to mix them up a little bit there before we just like all the murderers are all one person i know it's like every week i'm like oh no stay out of the suburbs <laughs> Stop drinking wine during the day, ladies. It no will judgments. only lead no judgments. But I was but like, just with your book character, it's probably going to go bad for you. Yeah, it is. There's, it is yeah, it really is. As somebody who's writing kind of like a literary domestic suspensey whatever or something right now, my character does drink wine during the day, and things are not going great for her. <laughs> oh, not so good, and it doesn't feel good for anybody who makes those life choices. At least not in fiction. <laughs> When you were saying so this was written over years and years yes. and i noticed at the beginning like so different passages would appear in different places what was that like like publishing yeah. a section at a time and a section here and there so it was it was showing up in like other magazines so people may have encountered some of these characters and then years later oh hey i'm oh, she's still here, still here. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> i did not kill them off in the meantime yeah, she's Goodbye. still alive she wasn't yeah. drinking wine during the day i guess oh um, exactly she, yeah, didn't, so, she didn't mysteriously fall down the stairs <laughs> no you know. i don't know it just it i started in grad school i the first piece i wrote was the second chapter is called cleaning house mm -hmm. and um 
And then I decided I wanted to write about Sarah again. So I think the next one I write, wrote might have been Whole New World. I don't remember her, people. It's been a long time. But <laughs> been 27 wrote, years. Yeah, yeah, you're, we're, we'll forgive not remembering the order you wrote this in when yeah. it was over decades and you had children in the middle and that will just do things to the memory. It does. And but, I, uh, yeah. yeah, so I just, but I liked her and I kept going. And um, I published some of the stories. I put some of them in my short story collection to lay to rest our ghosts, which came out in 2017. And at that time, and you will laugh about this because it, it it's true, but Allison, it is about what you can and can't remember. At some point <laughs> promoting that book, um, a book club asked me what would happen? Was there going to be more about Sarah and Glynnie? Because Geographies of the Heart was a story in that collection. And I said, yes, I you know, had hoped to finish it. I was working on it. And then I don't know, sometime later, uh, maybe six months, maybe a year, I decided I'm gonna finish, I am gonna finish this. I have so many pieces I've written, so many pieces, I'm gonna pull them all together. So I opened up my computer and I saw this this folder that said novel. I was like, oh, how exciting. And I opened it. <laughs> how exciting. How exciting. It's half done. <laughs> and in 2010, I had laid out everything I had at the time. Oh, wow. And I had put it together in a draft. So I was like, psych, this makes it so much easier to finish. <laughs> and so I- Did you I, think to yourself, why didn't I finish it then when I, after I did all this work? Because in 2010, we moved cross country with a three-year-old and a near two-year-old. And Ugh. Rick left his job to come into the business. And so I completely forgot I'd ever tried to pull a draft together. <laughs> but I had a draft. And so it gave me the courage to keep going because this was probably year 24. <laughs> you know? I'm more impressed that you managed to not lose the files in the meantime because, okay, I'm going to knock on my computer. Yes. Remember like having to transfer when computers are dying. And I was using a computer that was dying for a while and making sure mm. you don't lose files along the way. That's that's like the miracle right now. That's what I thought too. It's just like, down. how did you still have that folder on the desktop? I did. I, I think you're right. I think I kept moving it to each new computer. Yeah. But but you know, I think in the end, this may I know nobody wants to spend 25, 26, 27 years on a book. And I hope nobody ever has to. But <laughs> in, however it happens. It happens. <laughs> um, in the end, I think it was a better book. Um, because it took me so long and because it gave me a chance to really think through certain scenarios. And I just always give a big shout out to my editor at Fomite Press, Mark Estrin, because he, when he sent me the acceptance and I didn't know if he'd accept it, he took, he'd taken the stories, but I, I didn't know. This book is very different in some ways. And he did, and he had a couple of edits and then he had sort of a big global edit. Um, but he asked really great questions that sharpened the whole book for me. And that would never have happened if I hadn't had Mark help me and, yeah. you know, see the book out of my own tunnel. Oh, yeah. After yes. how many years yes. who can yes. pull you out and say, okay, I can see it from back here. And you're like, I can't see anything. I know. You're when you're writing it. it, we're in it. We're just mm -hmm. like, we're so in it that it's so difficult. And then like, you know, I remember I, a few weeks ago, I was meeting with my agent and we we're talking about my work in progress. And she just like made a suggestion. And I'm like, why didn't I think of that? Like, right? Yes. That, that does yes. make the book a million times stronger we all, we all and have, better. But we always have those blind spots for our own stuff. And it's, sometimes it's really hard to get away from that, which is why we have things like beta readers and editors and agents to be able to say, okay, this is what you're missing, or this is where it needs to be strengthened or adjusted yeah. just a touch. And it's still the book you wrote, but it's just a little bit tweaked. Yeah. You no, know, one of the questions Mark asked me is he said, why is Jen, why is Glennie an OBGYN instead of a surgeon? She seems mm -hmm. like she would have wanted to do surgery. Um, she's yeah. very precise. She's very careful. And and I thought, oh, you know, that's a really interesting question and observation. I understand what his thinking is about, about that. I do need to explain why, why she chose this. And so when I spelled it out, I felt like that was a moment in which Glynnie opened up as a person. I was going to say, it, it gives her shading there. Yes. Like instead of being all hard lines, I'm Glynnie, mm -hmm. I'm just a workaholic, she becomes 
more a human. human. Yeah. yeah. And, and she had a reason. And, and a, in a way, a reason that makes sense coming from this long family and these generations of women, her decision was about family, you know? Mm -hmm. And so, oh, duh. Yes, it's there, but I need <laughs> to say why, you know? Yeah. So it took a while, but it, I, I don't know. I, I think I got the right book out of it. And I've said this about my stories and I'll say this about my novel. My kids see that dreams take time, that they take work, yeah. that things don't always come easy. Um, they've been with me when there were rejections of stories. I'll never forget the day I came running in the kitchen. I was like, this was before any books came out. I have a story. It was accepted. And my son just went, and I realized later, oh. it wasn't him going necessarily, yes. I think it was him saying, oh, good. Finally, finally, yeah. my mom, finally, my mom got a touchdown, you yeah. know, because, but hey, they know that you got to keep fighting. You got to keep yeah. trying. You got to believe in yourself. It takes time. You know? Especially in this industry. I mean, oh, it's, this a, you know, hard. this industry is brutal. It's hard. Yes. It moves at a snail's pace too. So you're like, oh, like, you know, you send things out and then you're just like, maybe I'll hear back. Maybe I won't. Maybe and I'll I hear back a year from now. People who <laughs> aren't in it, they don't necessarily know how ridiculously slow things are. And then things can be, and it's not really linear in progress either because you can be doing well and then there can be a setback. And it's like, oh, you didn't take a step back. You took a hundred feet back and it's, you're, you're back. You're, you're not even in the stadium anymore. You got to get a bus back to the stadium. And that happens and you can either give up or you can just keep trugging forward. Yeah. So it's good for your kids to see that because there's, there's other stuff in life like that where you yeah. just, you can't just go, well, if I just do everything right, I will automatically have success. It's like, sorry, right. that's not like, that's not how this works. <laughs> no, no. And I think, I think it is a good lesson for them. And I think they're, they're happy for me and, you know, proud that I did it, things like that. But, you know, I also hope it gives writers heart. You know, a, a lot of the writers who come to us have been working on things for seven years or eight years and, yeah. and 10 years, five years. Or, or have books and boxes. I know Deborah Shepard showed up with her box of book that box she's like, this of has books. been in the closet for and and you know I, I love it's that fabulous but especially I mean and I, I don't I don't want to I don't want to get all feminist here but for those of us who maybe have small children that mean our trajectory of how quickly we can work on things like I was telling some of my writer friends I haven't written anything in a couple months now partially because I was releasing a book but even but after that it's like yeah all the little people are in my house 24 7 right now yes. and I don't have any thoughts going on up here that aren't don't hit your sister like that right. that's it once they're back in school I'll be able to kind of move forward but the uh the, the first book that I completed to the point of like this is going to get queried took several years and then once my youngest started school then it went from being half finished to complete it in just a couple months because hey now i have time for my thoughts to congeal into entire sentences is that's a really i mean that's a real thing i yeah. mean i i have when my kids were younger the way our house is you know i don't have an office where i close the door and yeah. i remember one day i was writing and i was working and the door flew open because my office is right by the front door because our house is you know small and all these children were running in and then were they, they were yours or other people's children too? No, <laughs> neighborhood kids because they all play games. So, and my kids were in the pack too. Okay. And then there was this hubbub and hubbub and blah, 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 blah. and I'm, you know, typing, working, and then they all ran out with Gatorades, you know. And, <laughs> and you're like, and now my concentration has been blown. Actually, <laughs> what's amazing was no. And what I've found is I can't work in the quiet. Yeah, um, because I'm used to the noise. But yes, things take time when you have little people or older people. Yeah. When you and I think, mom. you know, sometimes your brain's just your brain needs to, to rest. Yes. We can't yes. like writers are not always actively writing. Like, you know, mm -hmm. I love all those memes that say sometimes writing is staring out the window. Yes. Well, and you sent yeah. me the one Taika Waititi from yeah. yesterday or the day before where it's like sometimes it's staring at a blank page for eight hours and then closing the computer and that's writing too. We're like, yeah. <laughs> yes, that is. is. <laughs> and and yeah. sometimes it's, I, I know you mentioned being able to come away from it and then go back to it and how your brain can kind of work on that in the off time that I feel like there's a lot of subconscious going on 
that yeah. when you yeah. it, it sees things with new light and being able to step away from the work sometimes it's just as important as getting your brain in it. It's like this weird, this weird like yeah. you saw where you've got to be in it for a while and then out of it. So I am crossing my fingers that when children are back in school and I get my brain back in my work in progress, <laughs> I'll, something will click because right now nothing's clicking with it. I'm like, I don't know what I'm writing. I'll just keep typing words. So well, I mean, it, back there better it, work. It happened to me during the, when my current work in progress. I took like two months off from it. I was mm -hmm. like two or three months of just like, I can't because I don't know what, mm -hmm. what's happening. <laughs> I was just like, because well, I don't outline. I don't know process anything. for you because we were, we would talk about how you're definitely like this idea marinator where the idea mm -hmm. comes to you like a, a spark and then it has to kind of evolve a bit before you start typing. Like you, I know when you did Pretty Ugly, you had talked to me about it for at least a year, if not close yeah. to two years, yeah. you ever started typing that thing. And then and then it, it came and then it became the final product. Um, and right now the one you're working on, it was like idea and immediate typing because you were on a different deadline with your yeah. agent and everything. And so the process changed and therefore your way of bringing yeah. it out. I didn't have that time for it to like ferment. You're making kimchi out of your brain. Deadline better for you? I mean, because I've never had a deadline. <laughs> um, no, no, definitely not. And it wasn't even really a deadline, but no, it was just, just like it was just like a. She, my agent was excited about the idea. Um, wanted to see it. And by. Wanted to see something. Yeah. And I was like, like, usually oh. we're working with a finished product that we're either querying yeah. or like ready to release to betas and then self publish whatever you're exactly. doing. Exactly. Like I just it's pitched different. her an idea that I had like jokingly pitched to Allison the night before. I know. Before. And I'm like, but you know, that's a good idea, right? And, <laughs> I know. And, and then, then you went and told your agent next thing you know, you yeah. have because <laughs> after I told her all the ideas that I had that had been marinating in yeah. my head, I'm like that I'm ready to start writing. And I'm like, and I've got this other idea. And she's like, that's the one. Yes. And I'm like, yeah. Isn't that funny okay. how that works, though? Yeah. Don't joke about it. You'll have to write the book. I've told people this. Never joke about a book near me. I will make you write the book. <laughs> <laughs> Do the book. Do the book. But I love it because I think all of us have different ways our, our brains work. And one of my friends yesterday, one of my write owls was telling me, she's like, yeah, I'm staring at this and I need the computer to write my words. Like, it doesn't work that way. And she's like, okay, then you write the words. I'm like, I'm not writing your words either. You have yeah. to do it yourself. But sometimes it doesn't come and sometimes you can't even yeah. keep up. I mean, I know I've, I've written at times where my fingers can't go as fast as my brain. Yeah. And it's just a matter of, oh, how long did it take you? Well, that's as fast as I could type. And occasionally I had to sleep in there. But but sometimes it's like, yeah, I stared at this product for a while here and nothing came out. Yeah. And You're just like poking at a paragraph for like two days. Like maybe if I move this sentence over here. That's why hmm. I think it's really important because I I do think the industry is so tough that people support each other, that people be kind, that people um, share their wisdom, but listen, you know, I mean, just support. I mean, I know some people have the idea that they should write a certain number of words a day and good for them if that's what works. And yeah, if and it works. Listen, yeah. It. And I, you know, you, we all I have can't people do it. we care, but we all have people we care for. Yeah. So yeah. we all have people we're responsible to. So we can't do what other people do. But mm -hmm. I think I, I really do think it's important and perhaps increasingly important right now that people just be supportive, be kind, you know, yeah. and and help each other out with a cheer, even. Yeah. You know? I just, it's tough out there and it's important to be a good literary citizen. Uh, yes. Like, yes. Oh my gosh. So I, took a, I took a workshop um, <laughs> a few months ago and it was about, you know, the whole workshop was geared like how to submit to literary journals and each mm -hmm. day of the workshop because it met every day for 30 days. I did not do all 30 days. Uh, there was a different editor from a different literary journal saying like, this is what we look for, blah, blah, blah. And we talked about being a good literary citizen yes. in that class so many times. It's like, don't just talk about your own book. Right. Amplify the voices of yes. other writers. And I was like, I feel so good because I feel like- You do that. You guys do, do that all the time. We do yeah. this. This is why, you know. Hi. Yeah, Liz, <laughs> Hi. Everyone's mantra. Be kind, be supportive. And Elisa, I agree, but I'm still not writing those words for you. She <laughs> typed yesterday. You're amazing, Elisa, but I'm not I'm not typing for you because you type plenty lovely on your own. Dear. But yeah, yes. and I think 
that's one of the things, one of the things I love most about being able to do Vox Vominus and then the show that I do by myself to the moon, Allison, mm -hmm. I get to talk to awesome authors and then I get to share their books with other people who might not have ever heard of them. So sometimes yeah. I think of myself as like the book evangelist, like, have you seen yes. this one and shoving the book at people? Yeah. Yes. I love doing that. That's yeah. Funny. And I feel like we've also learned so much having this show and talking mm -hmm. to so many different authors and the amount of like, you know, horror stories that we've heard about the industry. Horror, like, lovely literary gothic horror, like what Jen no. writes. Real horror. Kind of real horror. Like, you know, when your publisher drops you and blah, blah, blah. Like just because we all, because writing is such a solitary thing. Like we, before, like when you're writing, when you're in it, you're just like, you're having problems. It just feels like, oh, I'm the only one that's having this problem. And then we talk to amazing best-selling authors and they're just like, remember that time that mm -hmm. my publisher dropped me? Remember that time well, that I, I couldn't get a book deal for 10 I think years? A lot of the times what we see on Twitter, especially is everybody's announcing their deal. Everybody's announcing they got the bestseller author. Everybody's announcing the, the next award they just won. Nobody's publicly saying, hey, here's where I'm struggling. Here's the thing that happened. And maybe there's some people that they share with privately and sometimes they don't share because they're under an NDA. Sometimes they don't share because yep. they're just like, <laughs> you know, I, it's, it's embarrassing or they just, don't, they don't want the pity party or whatever. But I think that it ends up like warping and it ends up feeling more isolated because then once something bad happens to you, you're like, I'm the only one this has ever happened to. And that's probably not true, but yeah. the person it happened to yesterday didn't tweet about it. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, I think it's hard to, I mean, I do think sometimes when you say things um, on social or wherever, where maybe you're struggling or something, there is this, this rush of people who do care, who are trying. And I do think yeah. sometimes that might be hard, you know, mm -hmm. once or twice I've said things just like, Oh, why was this person so mean when she could have chosen to respond in a kind fashion? And the, the yeah. rush of replies was sort of overwhelming to me. Like, we're sorry, somebody was mean to you. you know? that's true. I, have, I, I saw that today on Twitter. Somebody got a really like mean rejection and people were like, that's awful. I'm so sorry to hear that. Nobody needed to be mean. And then other people were sharing some of their mean ones. And it was just like, who, who, like, I, I get it. Not everything's going to be accepted everywhere, but there's never any call to be unkind or just cruel to people. Yeah. And sometimes people are in positions where they can do that and then they do. And maybe they were having a bad day, but it's still just not okay. Don't take it out on your local author. No, <laughs> don't. We have very low self esteem. <laughs> That's also true. <laughs> I think oh. I think in this case it was actually it was actually just an email, a business email, you know, and somebody bit my head off and I was like, oh, woo, wow, really? <laughs> you know? But I don't think in any context that it's called for. No, and I know that people have bad days. I, you know, we all have bad days. But I literally I literally sit in front of my computer sometimes if I get an email that I find difficult and I'll say, all right think this through, this is an awkward situation. Mm -hmm. Maybe they don't want to review the book or they're this or they're that or whatever. And just think, channel the kind, channel the kind reply, the productive reply, the reply that is, okay, thank you for your consideration. You know, maybe the email was really snippy. Can you give me any feedback as to why? I'd sure appreciate it. The no's are as helpful as the yeses. Have yeah. a super day. Let's uh, maybe next time. Yeah, you know, it's just like I literally sometimes sit there and channel the. Yes, this person was really rude. We will not be. We are not going to yeah, be. We don't have to respond. We don't now. have to be that way. Yeah, no, it's a choice. It's a choice. Okay. That's. I love that, Caitlin. You've been amazing. Oh, thank you. I had so much fun. Thank I can keep you for talking being here. I know we are out of time, but thank you for being here with us thank today. You. Mwah. And Thank you everybody so much. I was who honored. Is watching this live or on the replay. Thank you too. And um, make sure you tune in next week because it is Allison and I's two year Vox anniversary. What? So we're going to probably wear something stupid and celebrate. <laughs> Sounds about right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> pretty much. I think like last time we wore gowns. <laughs> I'll see what else I have in my closet. I, <laughs> I feel like I don't fit into any of my gowns anymore. So uh, yeah. yeah, we'll see. <laughs> so thank you, everybody. And we will see you all next week. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye. Thank you. <laughs>